You know, most of the time, I'm a man of many words. I don't have any words tonight, man. I don't have a single fucking word. The only words that I have in my vocabulary tonight are thrilling, amazing, fantastic, out of this world, unstoppable, perfect. Moro Ronaldo was back tonight. The analogies and the puns were all running wild tonight. Just like Hollywood Dream was running wild with the finger pointing and the big boot and the leg drop. But I will say this, man. You want a fucking analogy? This is an analogy for you. You're off the Mortal Kombat player select screen. On one hand, you're going to choose NXT because he's the best character in the game. On the other hand, you're going to choose Survivor Series. These two are going to battle in Shang Tsung's lair. NXT is going to win the battle, as always. They're going to pull out their fatality called NXT TakeOver War Games. And they're going to suck the soul of the main roster. Finish him! At this point, all we needed was a half an hour. And we knew where this show was going. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a man of many words on most days. Tonight I have none. Except the ones that I gave you. NXT TakeOver was a perfect show. This is not the NXT mark. This is not JD sucking NXT cock. This is just flat out truth. There's nothing I could say about this show that would make it any better. I can't even review this show. I would rather, at points, this show fuck up along the way so I have something to talk about. This was a perfect show. Compared to last year, this show blew last year's war games out of the water. Survivor Series is on Sunday night. Who? What? There's more wrestling this weekend? You don't need more wrestling this weekend, man. If you watch tonight, your weekend is fulfilled. Your weekend is all set. Go have a cold beverage on me and enjoy yourself. Don't bog yourself down with main roster garbage. That's probably going to leave you scratching your head at the end of the day. I watched four hours of this show, and I fucking hate myself. Man, NXT, I, I, I tell you all the time. I tell you all the time, man. This is what we need to see on the main roster. Four matches. Four matches we got tonight. Five, unofficially, with Riddle and Ono. But four matches we got. And I guarantee you that three of these matches will end up in your top ten at the end of 2018. If that doesn't make a near perfect show, I don't know what the fuck does in your honest opinion. This show was great. Absolutely fucking great. I can't review these shows, man. They're just too good to review. And I really don't even know what what to do. You know, it, it comes to a point when... I usually take notes on my iPad. I have my iPad sitting next to me. I have zero notes written. I have Shayna Baszler versus Kyrie saying NXT Women's Championship. And then after that, dot, 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 dot of nothing written. I didn't write one fucking note during this entire show. That's when you know that you're fucking invested in the show. That you're enjoying the show for what it is. And you're not even bothered by taking notes. You see, I'll take notes for Monday Night Raw because I know what's about to happen. They're about to speak garbage in my direction. And then I have to fucking rant about it on social media. And then come on here and do a one-hour review every Monday. I don't bother doing that with NXT, man. I like to enjoy myself. I know what I'm getting. I'm getting quality. And that's exactly what they gave you tonight. Four matches of quality. They don't overbear you with fucking seven, eight matches that went five hours. They gave you four matches tonight. And every single one of them delivered in their own way. 
and they got you excited about what is to come with the next set of TV tapings. It's all you want. It's all you can ask for. Triple H said it best. We do what we do because we want the fans to keep coming back for more. That crowd was hot. That show was great. And at the end of that War Games match, I still wanted another hour of NXT. I could have watched that shit for the rest of the night. Unbelievable show, man. I am envious of anybody that sat there in the Staples Center watching this show tonight. Unreal. You've seen a fucking classic. You've seen the best pay-per-view that WWE put on all year. And go figure, it's with the NXT name right in front of it. I am JD. Thank you guys so much for joining me, man. Please follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. I barely did any tweeting tonight because that's how damn good this fucking show was. Why am I going to bother tweeting when I'm too busy investing in what these guys are trying to portray in the ring, man? But follow me on social media. I'm sure there'll be a lot of complaining during Survivor Series on Sunday night. At JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Give that bell the middle finger, as you see there. And please follow me on Patreon, man. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. NXT War Games tonight took place from the Staples Center. First thing that we heard was the melodious voice of Mauro Ronaldo. He was back. Thank God he's back. Vic Joseph did a fantastic job. I think Vic Joseph is the second best commentator in the entire company, but... No one is a Moro Ronaldo. He was back. Show started off with bro, Matt Riddle versus Cassius Ono. Now, this match was supposed to take place. In fact, I believe it is still taking place on Wednesday when they taped the pre-show for NXT and we got this match and we're going to see that next week on TV. But Matt Riddle came out, his music hit, LA went crazy. And it was great to see Matt Riddle on his first takeover. The guy's too big of a name on the independent scene to not immediately put him on a takeover show. Moro even said that this wasn't on his schedule, but Riddle was set to face Ono on Wednesday's episode of NXT. Riddle hits the ring, and we see the landscape that is the War Games pay-per-view. You got the second ring next to it. You got the big cage hanging above. Riddle is in the first ring. Big chance of bro going on. And no, they ain't cheering for Vince Russo. They are cheering for Matt Riddle. So Riddle says, bro, to the crowd. They pop big. Riddle says he wasn't supposed to have a match on TakeOver. But if we saw the pre-show, which I'm sure you guys, if you were there, you seen it. A certain someone interrupted him. So there was a block from 6 to 6.30, which they taped. And then 6.30 to 7, which... They had Kathy Kelly sit down with Sam Roberts and do the pre-show. Riddle was on the pre-show with Sam Roberts and Kathy Kelly. Ono comes and interrupts. Riddle says that they were just hanging out in Los Angeles. We have two rings, so why not? Someone interrupted him, and his name was Cassius Ono. Ono comes out, and Ono insults Riddle, says he's too stupid to know he's not supposed to be out there. Maybe Riddle was smoking a little bit of the green stuff before he came to the curtain. I don't know. But Ono says that Riddle was too stupid to know he's not supposed to be out there. Ono goes on and says Riddle better enjoy this because he won't be able to remember what's about to happen. He goes on to say there's a referee. Let's do this thing right now. Bell rings. Ono enters the ring. And Riddle immediately rushes at Ono, jumping knee strike, knocked Ono out, fucking cold. One, two, three, Ono loses to Matt Riddle in about 10 seconds. That was it. A 10-second squash match to Matt Riddle. Now, I heard a lot of you guys on social media, you know, Riddle buried Ono, Ono was squashed, Etc., etc. Cassius Ono is at a point right now where it's funny how we all lobbied for him to be the guy to reveal himself as the attacker for Aleister Black. Obviously, that's not the case right now. WWE sees more value in Cassius Ono as a guy that's going to be there to mold future superstars, to put other guys over. 
Ono probably has a job for life in NXT. He's 38 years old. He probably has nothing to prove to anybody there. We all know what he's capable of. He probably won't achieve much on the main roster but just based on his look and his size and his weight. They really aren't going to do anything with Cassius Ono. It's not going to factor into any major storylines. The only thing that I could see with Cassius Ono is maybe a reformation of a tag team with Cesaro when Sheamus moves out of the picture. But even that is a toss-up. Cassius Ono has nothing to prove. This was his last chance. If he wasn't revealed as the attacker for Aleister Black, then that's it. This was not a burial. This was not a squash. This was Cassius Ono doing what he thinks is right. Matt Riddle is the future. Matt Riddle is going to be a future piece of WWE. Why not give this guy his first takeover, taste of takeover, and have him win in a fashion in which we believe Matt Riddle could beat anybody with? One, one strike, one blow, and you're done. No matter the size. This is WWE believing in Matt Riddle. This is WWE putting all their stock in Matt Riddle. I have absolutely no issues with this. Matt Riddle wins 10 seconds. We're going to see the rematch on Wednesday, and I'm sure it's going to be an actual wrestling match. They just did Riddle the favor here in front of his first takeover crowd. I don't have an issue with this whatsoever. Two out of three falls. The real takeover begins. This was the official scheduled start for NXT TakeOver War Games. Kyrie Sane versus Shayna Baszler. Two out of three falls match for the NXT Women's Championship. I stated before this match even started, and I made very bold predictions, and I creatively booked how I would go into Sunday, which Aina Baszler being the fifth woman on the SmackDown Survivor Series team. Now, she could still do that. We haven't seen anyone who is an NXT champion Debut on the main roster besides Kevin Owens as an NXT champion. Shayna is one of those people that could possibly be in that league. They did it with Kevin Owens. Triple H was a big Kevin Owens guy. Triple H is a big Shayna guy. Shayna being the fifth member of that team on Sunday night makes all the sense in the world. I am I am at this point where I would be very disappointed if Shayna Baszler was not the fifth member of the Survivor Series team. I don't want it to be Nikki Cross. I don't want it to be a Peyton Royce or a Billy Kay or a Lana or anybody like that. I don't want it to be anybody but Shayna Baszler. That is the perfect fit for that match. And it fits into everything beautifully. Everything beautifully. Have her make her main roster debut. She's eventually going to lose that championship to Kyrie Sane after what happened tonight. And that is the perfect role for Shayna Baszler on Sunday night to continue the Becky, Ronda, and Charlotte thing that I pitched on Off the Script this weekend. Now, this one was a match that I thought that they were going to take the title off of Shayna Baszler and give it back to Kyrie Sane. But you go back to Evolution in which Shayna Baszler won the championship you turn around two or three weeks after that, and it's very difficult to take the title off Shayna Baszler based on the body of work that she's shown you over the last year. So you knew WWE gave her the championship for a reason. But this two out of three falls match is something that a lot of people were looking forward to, man. There's one thing that I am disappointed with in this match. Everything else on this show was given an ample amount of time to just tell a story. I honestly felt at the end of this match that these women could have been given 10 more minutes and we could have got a four-star match instead of what I thought was a three-star match. I honestly thought these women got shafted in the amount of time that they were given. That is the only negative about this entire show. The fact that I wish these women were given about 10 more minutes to really drive home that this was the best match that these two women collectively put on together. That's it. Two out of three falls. We get the introductions. And Shayna Baszler, within minutes, wins the first fall. So the bell rings. Sane immediately rushes at Baszler, 
takes her into the corner. Sane, offense, offense, offense. Big neck breaker. Sane unloads with some chops against the ropes. She then charges with some forearms, sending Baszler to the floor. Sane runs off the apron with a flying elbow, and she starts yelling primally for just the entire atmosphere of the match. So Sane is really, really just feeling it right now. Sane brings it back into the ring, and quickly, right in the first fall, Marina Shafir, Jessamine Duke attack Sane, while Baszler has the referee distracted. She's playing possum in the opposite side of the ring. Shayna Baszler's playing possum. Old school move. Marina Shafir and Jessamine Duke come from out of nowhere, and they attack Kyrie Sane. Baszler then applies the Kirifuda clutch, and Sane taps out for the first fall. Done. So Shayna is up one zip. Fans are chanting bullshit at this point. Baszler drops Sane for another two count. Fans are really behind Kyrie Sane now, and they want her to make a comeback. Sane gets dropped into another submission from behind, and she finally makes it to the ropes to break it up. So Baszler tried to continue going for the Kirifuda clutch in this match. She wanted to end this quick, but Kyrie Sane knew when it was coming after that first fall. Baszler kept control, stomps on Kyrie's face. Baszler stands tall and poses as fans start to boo. Uh, Kyrie Saint finally makes it back to her feet and starts countering Shayna Baszler. She goes for a pin attempt, only a two count. Shane with a huge kick in the corner, strikes. Baszler comes back with some kicks, tries to mount some offense on her own. Baszler blocks some strikes, but Saint continues throwing strikes of her own. They trade strikes in the middle of the ring now. Baszler stops all that with a clothesline. Baszler charges, but Sane hits her. They end up on the apron, and Sane counters a move on the apron and drops Baszler on the ring apron with a fucking DDT. Now, at this point, I honestly thought Shayna Baszler was legit injured. That was a nasty fucking bump on the apron with that big DDT. I'm surprised that she got up from that, man. That was a devastating fucking move. It was a nasty fall. Baszler falls to the ground. Both Shafir and Jessamine do go to check on her. Fans are chanting, holy shit, at this point. Sane ends up going to the top while Baszler is down on the outside. Hits the big, insane elbow on the outside, taking everybody out. Fans are chanting NXT. Sane brings Baszler back into the ring. Hits the insane elbow once again off the top rope. Hits the elbow and gets the second fall. Sane is in control right now. She goes right at it after the second fall. Hits an interceptor. Not once, but twice. And then hits three in a row. Sane drops Baszler with a spinning back fist. Sane goes to the top, but Baszler cut her off. Baszler then climbs up. They start trading shots. Sane with some headbutts. Baszler continues to fight back. She unloads with strikes while they're up top. And Baszler tries for a super gut-wrench suplex. But Kyrie Sane slides down. Turns it into a sit-out power bomb and rolls it into a pinning combination for a two-count. Sane then calls for the insane elbow again. Sane body slams Baszler. Duke gets on the apron again to distract the referee, allowing Shafir. Soon as Kyrie Sane got up to the top rope, Marina Shafir got up to the apron and shoved Kyrie Sane off the top rope. All of a sudden, Dakota Kai comes out of nowhere. Takes out both Jessamine Duke and Marina Shafir at ringside. They turn it into a huge melee on the outside. Then, out of nowhere to everybody's surprise, Io Shirai comes out of nowhere, runs down, runs immediately to the top rope. And my God, man, did she put Charlotte to shame six lifetimes over with this fucking moonsault, man. She goes to the top rope. And hits the most picture-perfect acai moonsault that you will ever see. Taking out everybody on the top rope. Sane goes for the insane elbow. But Baszler catches her on the way down and turns it into a pin for the win. To retain the title. Even with the help to neutralize the horsewomen on the outside. Shayna Baszler gets the win. And she retains the NXT Women's Championship, man. This was a great fucking conclusion to this match, man. 
Something that I really did not see coming. I figured the horsewoman would get involved, but I had no idea about Dakota Kai, and I had no idea about Io Shirai. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here with the NXT Women's Championship? Kyrie Sane is not going to be without that title for much longer. I am still predicting Shayna Baszler gets called up to the main roster. Shayna Baszler can do double duty. Shayna Baszler can work NXT, and she can work the main roster. It's been done before. And I honestly think Shayna Baszler is going to be this year's Kevin Owens. When Kevin Owens feuded with John Cena, he was up to the main roster as NXT champion. There's no reason. There's no reason why Shayna Baszler can, cannot do that as NXT Women's Champion. As long as she fits into the storyline, which she does, and we're seeing a lot more of Mar- Marina Shafir and Jessamyn Duke. So you know what they're priming both of them for. They're getting them some TV time. They're getting their names out there to the general public watching the TV show. And they're planting seeds for what is to come with Ronda Rousey and the rest of the horsewomen, both on WWE and MMA side. This was great. So what I see happening here is this. I see Kyrie and Shayna winning or, or having a match and Kyrie winning the NXT Women's Championship at the next set of TV tapings. That's what I think. I honestly think we get a steel cage match with Kyrie and Shayna and Shayna drops the title during the next set of TV tapings. From there, what I think happens is we get a six-woman tag because I've read reports that The trainers in NXT are incredibly impressed with how Marina Shafir and Jessamyn Duke have come along. That they are so far along right now, and the trainers are confident enough in them after seeing them train and then putting them on NXT live shows that I would not be surprised if WWE puts them on the next TakeOver show in Phoenix Royal Rumble weekend. And we see Kyrie Sane, Dakota Kai, and Io Shirai getting them on a takeover show for the first time against Marie Shafir, Jessamyn Duke, and Shayna Baszler. And that's going to be the last hurrah for all of them. Kyrie's going to win the battle. Kyrie's going to win the battle. That is the NXT Women's Championship. Shayna and the Horsewomen are going to win the war, and they're going to take that war right to the main roster. That's my prediction with that. Other than that, this was a great match. If it would have went another 10 minutes, it would have been a classic. That's the only gripe I have with this match. The fact that it did not go an extra 10 minutes. But this was a great way to open the show. That second second fall and that third fall were fucking brilliantly booked. I loved everything about it. I just wish it was a little bit longer. The one match that I was saying could be the best match of the entire weekend, man. There's no way that these guys were ever going to disappoint anybody. And these guys really... Prove to everybody that, you know, you want to talk about Sunday night and you want to talk about the rest of everything that's on this show, we're going to make it very difficult for anybody else this entire weekend, not just on this show, to follow what we're about to do. Johnny Gargano versus Aleister Black, the biggest storyline in all of NXT. Who attacked Aleister Black? It was Johnny fucking Gargano. I'm loving this Johnny Gargano character, man. I I said it on social media, and it was funny how Johnny came out tonight. If you guys realized how he came out, he came out as regular good old Johnny. He came out smiling. He came out to his poppy theme song. He was wearing black. You know, instead of, uh, you know, being very, you know, just out there with the vibrant colors, he was wearing, he was wearing the black and white, man. He was, he was repping those black Spider-Man. That dark Spider-Man color. And it's something that I, you know, pitched as just a a basic comparison. Johnny is Spider-Man, and he is the dark version of Spider-Man. When the Venom symbiote tried to, you know, just infiltrate his body. That's exactly what Johnny Gargano was going through right now. He's got split personalities. Johnny is thinking that he, he, he didn't do anything wrong. Johnny is still portraying himself as the hero. But we all know Johnny, deep down, it's going to take something for him to snap and his alternate personality is going to come out. I'm loving it. Triple H tonight on the post show mentioned that you don't want to fuck 
with evil Johnny Gargano, that there's more evil in Johnny than people are actually realizing. And I think WWE is going to really, uh, I would say, for back a lot of term, for back, uh, for a lack of better term, double down on Johnny Gargano's heel gimmick. And I think they're really going to amplify what he's about to do in the coming months. Now, what I stated that they do here is Johnny win. I didn't really think that Aleister Black had much to prove, and I honestly fucked up here. I, I honestly didn't really think ahead. For the first time in a long time, I, I didn't really think ahead, because the natural progression of things here is for Aleister Black to go on and challenge Tommaso Ciampa for the NXT Championship, because he was actually fucking robbed. And I didn't really think that when I was doing my predictions. I was going with Johnny because I was so in the mindset of Johnny winning this match and then kind of building his relationship up with Champa and then trying to kill Champa from within. So that was my mindset. I, I didn't really think about Aleister Black coming back into NXT for his first match after being out for about four months. And now here he is. And this guy's due an NXT Championship match. So the right thing to do would have Aleister Black win. And I didn't really think of that. And that's exactly what happened here tonight, man. This was a great match. This is easily, easily going to be on everybody's top 10 list for 2018, man. These guys, this is exactly why I wanted to see both of these guys competing for the NXT Championship. These guys, the way they work together, absolutely fucking masterful. Masterful stuff from both Black and Gargano. Gargano drops Black with a clothesline. This is where things just really fucking just amp up. Eyes wide open. You're invested in literally everything that they're doing. Gargano drops Black with a clothesline. Gargano counters and drops Black into a Gargano escape in the middle of the ring. Nowhere to go for Aleister Black. Black rolls him over for a two count. Counters the hold somehow. Black misses a sweep. Takes a kick to the head from Gargano. Gargano with snake eyes into the middle turnbuckle. Gargano then smiling sadistically as Black is down. Gargano looks around. Crowd uh, is going crazy. You know, they're invested in the match. They were honestly very split. Very 50-50 for Black and Gargano. Because Johnny still has his fans. Those fans never went away. But there are a portion of the fans that realize that Johnny is the one to do bad. And that he ruined Aleister Black. And they're going to portray him as a heel. He's not a full-fledged heel yet. But Johnny is playing both sides. So that's what they're doing right now. Black is taunting him. So Gargano pulls a taunt from his DIY days. And he's doing the, the whole gimmick. And he's getting ready to do, meet him in the middle. He's about to drop him on a knee. Black is sitting Indian style in the middle of the ring. And you could visibly hear him say, Give me your best shot. Bring it. Give me your best shot. So Johnny Gargano is welcoming this open invitation. He drops down his knee pad. He's getting ready to drop the big knee on Aleister Black as he sits Indian style in the middle of the ring. Gargano delivers the flying knee, but Black ducks out of the way. Gargano comes back with a kick and a running knee to the face for a two count. And Black powers out. Gargano can't believe that Black kicked out and he doesn't know what to do at this point. Gargano then, more offense, while they're both on their knees, they're trading shots back and forth, Black gets the upper hand, unloads with more strikes, Black with a jumping knee to the head, and might I tell you that everything that these guys were throwing at each other looked stiff as fuck, not only in this match, but literally everybody on this entire show looked like they were bringing their most stiffest shit ever, it looked legit. So Black with a jumping knee to that. He springboards, but Gargano dumps him over the top rope. Black went for that big acai moonsault that he does. Gargano shoved him over the top rope. Gargano then runs the ropes for a suicide dive, but Black meets him with a huge knee to the face. They're both down on the floor, and fans are chanting, Mamma Mia. This is one of many times that the fans in LA at the Staples Center chanted Mamma Mia. So Black brings Gargano back into the ring. Black stands over Gargano. As Gargano grabs his boot and pleads with him. Johnny is pleading with Black to put him out of his misery. Put him out of his misery. Now, that's very Spider-Man-esque, man. That's very Spider-Man-esque. 
in its own right. You know, it, it, it came to a point where Peter Parker couldn't stand just this fucking black shit all over him. He couldn't stand dark Peter Parker anymore. Gorgano stands up. is about to let Black hit him with a black mask, but he tries to roll Black up instead. So he was playing possum. Johnny Gargano was playing possum. This leads Gargano to applying again the Gargano escape. Black tries to get to the ropes, but Gargano repositions Black in the middle of the ring and tightens the hold. Black rolls him over and out. But Black with a big spinning knee kick to the face, or big spinning knee to the face. Black stunned for a bit. He drops to his uh, he drops his knee pad and nails a big knee to the jaw. Black keeps Gargano from falling over. He has him in the black mass. He has him on his boot. And he looks in Gargano's eyes and says, Johnny, I absolve you of all your sins. And he delivers a black mass, knocks J Johnny Gargano completely fucking out with the black mass. One, two, three, and that is it. I fucked up in the predictions here. I thought that Johnny really needed the win here based on his storyline, and I didn't really think ahead to Aleister Black and where he's going to be going. Now, just like Shayna Baszler, I think Aleister Black is getting called up to the main roster relatively soon within the next three months. There is a possibility that Aleister Black could be called up and be a surprised, you know, guest or individual in the Royal Rumble. He could be a big surprise in the Royal Rumble. But Aleister Black got this win, and Triple H even made mention that, you know, Tommaso Ciampa is completely at the top of his game right now. And Aleister Black is going to really have to dig down deep to find out and figure out what it takes to beat a guy like Tommaso Ciampa right now who's completely obsessed with being the NXT champion. So, Alistair Black beat Johnny Gargano. He positioned himself to be the number one contender for the NXT championship and get an opportunity to get the title back that he never lost. So, this is great. And at that point, I'm assuming Johnny is going to be involved with Champa, and Champa is going to get past Black with probably Johnny's help. That's the way I envisioned it. And from there, we see Johnny and, and Tommaso Ciampa kind of building a friendship. And then Johnny trying to kill Ciampa from within and maybe take the title WrestleMania weekend. That's what I'm seeing. So we might not see Johnny go full-fledged heel yet. It may be when we see that moment of camaraderie between him and Ciampa once again, where... He's completely turned to the dark side. But this was a huge step for Aleister Black in the right direction to get back to his winning ways, to get another NXT Championship match, and I thought this was fucking great. Easily, 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 easily. One of the best matches of the entire year for not only NXT, but WWE in general. You know, a lot of people are talking about the Velveteen Dream tonight, man, and rightfully so. Velveteen Dream... He's 23 years old, and he has the makings. And don't at me. I don't give a shit what his skin color is. I don't give a shit what perception of black wrestlers have on the main roster. I don't care. I don't care. If WWE does not see money in the Velveteen Dream, then they're doing this entire business wrong. The Velveteen Dream is a future WWE champion. He has everything that you would want in a professional wrestler. He's got the look. He's got the charisma. He, he lives his gimmick. He's fucking great in the ring. And my God, can the guy fucking go. He is absolutely unbelievable. A lot of people are talking about how great the Velveteen Dream is, and we know this. But I pose a question to you guys. Why do you think the Velveteen Dream had his best match to date on this night at NXT TakeOver War Games in 2018? Why? And I don't want to sound like a fucking Mark, but I'm happily a Mark for Tommaso Ciampa. The reason why the Velveteen Dream had as great of a match as he did tonight was because that's how good Tommaso Ciampa has been. And people are talking about taking the title off of Tommaso Ciampa. Why would you do such a thing? 
Why? I mention this time and time and time again. If you are the very best at what you do, why would you ever think about taking the championship off of the very best that you have right now? Look at that roster. Look at that roster of talent. Adam Cole, Ricochet, Pete Dunne, Roderick Strong, Kyle O'Reilly, Alistair Black, Johnny Gargano, Velveteen Dream, Lars Sullivan. Look, look, look at that roster. EC3. Look at the people who weren't even on this show. Matt Riddle, Cassius Ono, Keith Lee. Look at the roster of talent that they have in NXT. Above all, it's Tommaso Ciampa. That's how great he's been. Look at what he's done with guys much bigger than him. He brought Otis Dojovic to a great fucking match. Best match of his fucking life. He did the same thing with Velveteen Dream tonight. That's how good the champ is. When he says he's the greatest sports entertainer of all time, you think he's just saying that because it's a fucking gimmick? The guy lives up to everything that he states in that ring. The guy was masterful. Velveteen Dream, he is great in his own right. But the reason why he had the greatest match of his entire fucking life tonight was because of Tommaso Ciampa. And that's how good Dream is. If Dream can work with the best, then this guy has all the makings for everything Vince needs on the main roster. Simple as that. Dream came out dressed as for the second time. He did the yellow and red first, and now he's doing the black and white. Dream, in Hollywood, in L.A., came out dressed as Hollywood Hogan. He came out wearing the Hollywood bandana. He came out wearing purple tights with lightning bolts running down. He had eyes on each of his ass cheeks, and he had an NWO-like shirt that said O-V-A, and underneath it said Dream over. Over. Velveteen Dream was living the gimmick, man. He channeled his inner Hogan. He even did the finger point of doom. He even hulked up. He did the big boot. He did multiple leg drops. He channeled Hulk Hogan tonight. Now, some of you might not like that. But listen, Dream is a take on a lot of old school characters. He's done the Jake the Snake. He's uh, with the tights. He did Ravishing Rick Rude. He does Macho Man. Now he's doing Hulk Hogan. There's nothing wrong with paying homage to guys that you grew up idolizing and are a reason why you're here. I've seen some people making a big stink about it on social media. Who, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? We're not thinking about Hulk Hogan in that ring. We're watching Dream. We're watching the Velveteen Dream, Patrick Clark. Who gives a shit? who he's representing on his tights or who he's paying homage to. We're all professional wrestling fans. Without Hulk Hogan, none of this would be here. So cut the shit. So the guy could do wrong, he did wrong. Fine. But don't let his personal life misconstrue what the guy did for the business. The guy's a fucking idiot. We all understand this. But don't let that blind you to the fact that Hogan is the reason why Vince McMahon has a fucking WWE to begin with. So, just leave it right there. I love the fact that he paid homage to Hollywood. Hollywood Hulk Hogan is the best iteration of Hulk Hogan in his entire career. So, he paid homage to the greatest version that was Hulk Hogan in my eyes. Don't at me. Hogan is a heel much more superior than Hogan as the yellow and red. That's just my honest opinion. This match... Again, I, I, I don't even know how to review this fucking thing. You had three matches on this show. You had Black and Gargano. You had Dream and Champa, And then you had the, 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 the War Games match. <laughs> three matches in your top three, in, in your top ten. Top three matches of the year. Like, I, don't know, I don't know what else to tell you guys. This was fantastic. Absolutely fucking fantastic. They made you believe. They made you believe. More so than any other time in his title run that Champa was going to lose this fucking thing. And I legitimately jumped off my couch watching the closing segments of this match. 
You ain't beating the fucking champ, I yelled out. Champa is trying to counter suplexes. Him, he and Dream are trying to counter suplexes. Dream suplex Champa over the top rope to the floor. They both land hard. Referee starts counting. Dream brings Champa back into the ring just in time. He, he makes it by eight or a nine count. Champa strikes, and before they start trading shots in the middle of the ring, Champa kicks Dream, goes for he, his finishing move, the fairy tale ending. Dream counters it. Champa rolls him up for a possible win, but the referee argues with him after catching a handful of tights. Dream takes advantage and drops Champa with a huge super kick. Two count only. Back and forth now as Champa catches Dream in midair. Champa, more offense. Another two count. After hitting a Project Champa. So he hits Project Champa for a two count. Fans start chanting for Dream. Champa starts to sell his knee. Okay? Champa goes to ringside, grabs the title, brings it into the ring, and the referee grabs it. Now, keep in mind that Champa grabbed the title. Dream did not grab the championship. You following me? Champa grabbed the title, brought it into the ring. Dream did not. So he brings it into the ring. Referee grabs the title. Dream takes advantage, rolls him up for a two count. Okay? Dream ends up dropping Champa on the title with a DDT. Now, he was looking around. He dropped him with a DDT, and, 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 and Dream was worried that he was going to get disqualified. He didn't bring the title back in the ring. The title was there. It was all Champa's fault. He was just doing what he had to do, and the referee did not disqualify him, man. That's a nice little piece to the overall story of this match. The fact that Champa brought the title in, and Dream didn't, but Dream used it, and the referee didn't, didn't disqualify him because he didn't bring it in the ring. He didn't touch the title. He never even touched the title. No DQ. You gotta love it, man. You gotta love it. Makes the cover. Champa kicks out. Dream goes to the top for the big purple Rainmaker elbow drop. Puts on the brakes as Champa gets his boot up. Back and forth. Champa hits a DDT of his own for a two count. This is where things get crazy, man. This is where I jumped off my fucking couch. Champa goes over and starts pulling up the padding from the floor on the outside. Very a la Johnny Gargano in their many battles. So he starts ripping up the padding. Fans are chanting, this is awesome. Now we got part of the concrete exposed. Champa rocks Dream with some strikes. Champa then tries to hit a draping DDT from the apron to the concrete. But Dream counters and rams him into the announce table where Moro, Nigel, and Percy are all sitting. So, Champa, I don't know what spurred this on, but Moro, he usually takes the microphone, he starts yelling into the microphone. Champa takes whatever notes Moro had on the table and crumbled them up and threw them at Moro Ranala. Now, if you really want to be a fucking piece of shit and you really want to get on the people's skin, this entire crowd was chanting Mamma Mia all fucking night. Moro has become a fucking icon to the NXT brand just by his voice. So if you want to get on people's bad sides, let's start bullying Moro Ronaldo on the outside. You got to love Tommaso Ciampa. And you know Ciampa knows what Moro has been saying. The scourge of NXT, this psychotic son of a bitch. You think Ciampa's not listening to this shit? He knows. So all of that frustration as he just standing next to Moro Ronaldo took it, took it and just threw it at him. Took, just took all that fucking frustration and threw it at Moro Ronaldo. Gotta love it. So, he throws Moro's papers at him, starts bullying him at ringside. So, Champa turns around into a huge rolling DVD on the floor. Rolling Death Valley driver on the floor. Dream brings it back into the ring. Goes to the top for the purple Rainmaker, but Champa kicks out. I jumped out of my fucking seat after the Purple Rainmaker. I'm like, they cannot give Dream the title. You can't do it. You can't do it. Jumped out of my seat. I'm like, motherfucker, you ain't beating the champ. You ain't beating the champ tonight. Dream ends up going for another from the apron. So Champa, after kicking out, rolled to the bottom rope, 
just like any smart champion would do. And he's hanging off the bottom rope. So Dream goes to the top rope, delivers a purple Rainmaker off the top rope to the apron like he did to EC3. And he missed. So he missed the second elbow and he hits the apron, lands on the floor hard as Champa moved out of the way. Dream rolls around in pain, starts selling his elbow injury. Champa has his knee injury. Champa brings it in, drops Dream with a DDT on a steel plate between the two rings because the two rings were set up for war games. So the middle steel grate that connected both rings in the war games match, he brings Dream into the ring and gives him a draping DDT on the steel fucking divider in the middle of the ring. So Champa drags Dream over, covers him for the win after that draping DDT on the steel and retains the title. Unreal. Absolutely unreal, man. Tommaso Ciampa, I think we all need to bow down to Tommaso Ciampa right now. He is the very best that NXT has to offer. And he's going to be the very best for a very long time. There has been no one, and he surpassed Johnny in my eye. There has been no one in NXT right now that has been on Tommaso Ciampa's level. I've said it weeks and weeks and weeks now. Johnny was primed to take that spot from Tommaso Ciampa. Somehow, Tommaso Ciampa has been so good that Johnny, his stock has been falling and Ciampa's stock has been rising. And Ciampa's stock has not found a way to decline yet. He's been up there and he stayed up there. And if you guys don't believe in that, I don't know what the fuck you're watching, man. I know a fucking prime talent when I see one and Tommaso Ciampa right now is absolutely untouchable. There is no, not even an Aleister Black, there is no one on this roster right now that should take that title from Tommaso Ciampa. It wasn't Dream. It wasn't anybody else. It's not going to be Sullivan or an EC3 or a Ricochet. It's going to be Johnny. It's going to be Johnny. And this story right now, we haven't, he, we haven't even hit its peak with this story. We're now picking up the pieces from what it should have been in August. This is going to be a fucking major roller coaster ride going on into Royal Rumble weekend and on into WrestleMania. And I can't fucking wait for it. This was a fucking goddamn classic. Easily one of the best matches of the entire year. Second time in a row that Velveteen Dream has landed himself in one of the best matches of the year. And this is a common theme for Tommaso Ciampa. Tommaso Ciampa is going to be in three, four different matches in the top 10 best matches of the year. If that doesn't tell you the caliber of fucking athlete that Tommaso Ciampa is, I don't know where you're getting your information from, bro. Tommaso Ciampa retains the NXT Heavyweight Championship. The one thing that I loved about War Games this year was the fact that it went back to more of a traditional way to do things. Last year, we had three teams of three. We had the Undisputed Era, we had Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, and Bobby Fish. Then we had Roderick Strong and AOP, and then we had Sanity. Those were the three teams in War Games last year. It was a little bit more different in 2017 than it was this year. This year was a little bit more of a traditional vibe, a traditional pace, which, to me, made this year's match all that much more better. Honestly. Instead of having teams enter, because you had three teams last year, each individual member of the teams that you have, the heel team and the babyface team, Undisputed Era, and then the team led by Ricochet and Pete Dunne with the War Raiders. Each individual guy got their opportunity to come in one at a time. I enjoyed this one so much more than last year's because you got a true sense of what War Games really is. You got that old school feel. So I really love that aspect of it. Undisputed Era right now, is the best group in all of WWE. They came out wearing matching camouflage yellow trunks. They all looked primed for their spot. They all looked absolutely, in a better sense of the word, they looked like fucking superstars tonight. Every single one of them looked like superstars tonight. They are on top of their game. And the team comprised of Ricochet, Pete Dunne, and the War Raiders, man, 
they brought it as well. I, I don't really know what else to say about this match. It, it, it was 40 minutes of unadulterated carnage. And it, it sucks that... In fact, I'm, I'm going to rephrase that. I'm glad NXT has this match each and every year. I'm glad that come Survivor Series weekend, this is a staple for NXT. Because I know that NXT is going to do it fucking right. They're going to honor the tradition of this match. I'm glad that it's not going to see the time of day on the main roster. So, we had a very old school feel to this match. Undisputed Era got the advantage on the go-home show with NXT television when Kyle O'Reilly beat a member of the War Raiders. Okay? So, they had the one-up advantage. I love the way NXT set this thing out for the entirety of this match. Adam Cole started the match. Ricochet started the match for his team. So, Right out of the gate, we got a classic reborn from NXT TakeOver Brooklyn for the North American Championship. We got Adam Cole and Ricochet starting this match off, and that's five minutes of Ricochet and Adam Cole in the ring with no interruptions whatsoever. So every three minutes, you got the first two guys to start. Undisputed Era's got the first advantage in the match because they won the match on the go-home show. So every three minutes, we have a revolving door of talent coming in from each team. Kyle O'Reilly made his appearance. So he was the second one in, and he got the two-on-one advantage with Adam Cole over Ricochet. Then we had Hanson come in. Hanson, of all guys. It wasn't Roe. It wasn't Pete Dunne. It was Hanson, the big man, who wanted to be in there, and he wanted to get into the, into the match and just cause unadulterated fucking chaos. If there's an MVP in this match, at the end of the night, a lot of people are going to look at Pete Dunne. A lot of people are going to look at Ricochet for the shit that he did. Crazy shit that he did in this match. Some people may think Adam Cole for lasting as long as he did in this entire match. My MVP of this match? You're going to look at fucking Hanson. A guy his size. He played the role of Killian Dane last year. Killian Dane was the MVP of War Games last year with the shit that he did and the fucking chaos that he just brought forth in the War Games match. Hanson did the same thing in the same way that Killian Dane did it last year. Hanson is a guy who is so big and a guy that size moving around the way he does, springboarding off the fucking second rope, flying off the top rope through fucking tables. The guy is absolutely fucking crazy. Absolutely crazy. If you didn't know of the War Raiders or you didn't think too highly of the War Raiders before this match, I guarantee you, your opinion of the War Raiders has changed after this match. That is a very respectable fucking showing for a guy that size. And now, I guarantee you, whenever we get Undisputed Era, Roderick Strong or, or, or Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish against War Raiders, you are going to be that much more excited for that match when it happens. I can't wait to fucking see it. I can't wait to see it. So, we got Hanson in the match. Then, all of a sudden... We got Roderick Strong coming in. So now it's a three-on-two advantage. We got Ricochet, Hanson in the ring with Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, and Roderick Strong. Roderick Strong, I can't even begin to tell you. Roderick Strong. I, I know a lot of you guys feel the same way. He, 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 he just has a new breath of life in Undisputed Era. The guy, Undisputed, joining Undisputed Era has changed Roderick Strong's fucking life completely. It changed his mentality. It changed everything. Everything about him. Roderick Strong looked like... He, he looked vanilla. Away from on the speed error. He looked vanilla. Dating... This is a year turnaround. A year turnaround for Roderick Strong. He looked vanilla standing next to AOP. We knew how talented he was. We knew what the guy brought to the table. But Roderick Strong now, a year removed from 2017. Look at where he is now, man. The guy looks like a proverbial fucking superstar. He belongs in Undisputed Era, and that was the best decision that anybody in creative could have ever made to put him on in, in Undisputed Era, man. It's been a life-changing moment for Roderick Strong. So Roddy's in there giving Undisputed Era a three-on-two advantage. So then we got Roe. Roe's in there, right? Roe comes in. He's joining Hanson. Now we got an even playing field. Bobby Fish. Bobby Fish, who's coming off an injury, got his leg heavily wrapped, Bobby Fish wants to start some fucking hijinks on the outside. He's the last one to come out, giving Undisputed Era a four-on-three advantage. 
So Bobby Fish, instead of going to the ring to help Undisputed Era, instead he wants to pick a fight with Pete Dunne. So he attacks Pete Dunne. Pete Dunne is locked in a shark cage on the outside on the stage. He's kicking Pete Dunne. He drags Pete Dunne by the arm and shoves him into the fucking steel of the shark cage. He locks Pete Dunne in his own shark cage with the lock that was on his shark cage. So not only is Pete Dunne locked with the original lock that was on his cage, it's now double locked because Bobby Fish said, fuck this, you ain't coming out of that cage. He takes the key, he starts kissing the key goodbye, throws the key into the fucking crowd. Pete Dunne has no way in to the War Games match. It's going to remain a four-on-three advantage. So, meanwhile, Undisputed Era has a four-on-three advantage in the ring. Pete Dunne, the timer goes off, the three minutes expire. He has no way to get into the match. He's trying to shake the cage. He's fucking going crazy like a rabid animal. The, the referee has a key. He unlocked one lock, and the key that he had didn't work for the other lock. So they were shit out of luck. Pete Dunn's going crazy. The other referee goes to the back. I'm over here thinking, why is it so difficult for these guys to get fucking bolt cutters? Tommaso Ciampa had bolt cutters the last two times that he was in the ring with Tommaso Ciampa. They're as easy as to just go underneath the ring and find them and just pluck them underneath from, from underneath the ring. There was everything else underneath the fucking ring. Tables, kendo sticks, chairs. It was a fucking Terry Funk hardware store underneath there. Why wouldn't there be a fucking bolt cutter underneath the ring. So, one of the referees comes out and grabs a bolt cutter, cuts the lock, here's Pete Dunne, War Games officially begins. This was fucking great, man. A great way to build anticipation. And I love the fact that we got Cole and Ricochet to start, and then Pete Dunne is the guy selling a big injury coming off the, the, the go-home show. The last guy, the equalizer, the UK champion, Trying to be that big moment in this match to give his team the victory for War Games. This was fucking great, man. Um, when War Raiders came in, they did exactly what Sanity did last year. There was there was chairs, there was trash cans, kendo sticks. People were calling for tables just like they were last year. I, I remember vividly, man. I remember vividly like it was yesterday. Killian Dane had chance of tables, tables, and he. Happily obliged. Same thing happened here at the Staples Center. Hanson had tables on the outside, and he threw tables into the ring. It was it was craziness, man. They were locked inside this double fucking steel cage with nothing but fucking carnage around them. So all eight superstars are in, right? We got the War Raiders standing a table up in the ring. Hanson places call on top of it. At that point, one of the legs break. Or it doesn't break, it slides off. So Hanson goes over there to fix it, and fans are booing. They thought the table broke, they thought it was a botched spot, but they handled it very beautifully, man. So Hanson fixes the leg, stands the table back up, Roe grabs Cole from the middle of the two rings and goes for a power bomb. Cole fights out. Hanson ends up power slamming Cole for a two count, and Kyle O'Reilly breaks it up with a chair shot to the back. Roe then grabs Cole again, but Fish hits him with a kendo stick in the back. Uh, Bobby Fish coming off injury had a very good match here. He, he looked like he didn't miss a beat. So Fish then sends Roll crashing hard into the table that was standing up in, in the middle of the two rings, was propped up against the cage, right on the metal divider. So he throws Roe through that table, and they go crashing. They're both taken out for the time being. Cole works over Ricochet in the corner in front of the standing table that collapsed. So Cole takes Ricochet to the top for a superplex through the table. Ricochet counters and slides down. Cole is in the tree of woe. Here comes Kyle. He makes the save. Ricochet unloads, place, placed O'Reilly on top of the table. Cole is still upside down in the corner. Strong with a knee to the jaw right on Ricochet. O'Reilly then applies a submission from the table to Ricochet. Hanson stands on the top rope. So you have, picture this. Kyle O'Reilly is on top of the table doing a submission to Ricochet, and he's wide open. Hanson flies off the top rope through the table, and when I mean you find, just just picture yourself with a fuck. Say I'm I'm you're, you're me, and you see an ant crawling along the fucking table, and you take you take something, and you squash it, killing it, 
This is what exactly Hanson did to Kyle O'Reilly while he, while he had that submission on Ricochet. He came off the top rope, and when I mean he splatted Kyle O'Reilly like a fucking pancake, he squashed him like a bug off the top rope, man. Big splash through the table, huge frog splash. That pin was broken up. Fans are going fucking crazy. All eight superstars are down. Everybody's down. It's mass carnage in the ring. Adam Cole gets up first. Cole then tries to climb the cage to escape. Ricochet then meets him at the top. Again, we were having deja vu. Remember when I mentioned Hanson was kind of channeling his inner Killian Dane here in 2018? Trying to mirror what he did in 2017? Adam Cole tried to do the same thing he did last year. He climbed the steel cage. I don't know if he wanted to escape or not, but I'm telling you, man, I love Nigel McGuinness. This is why I love NXT's announcers, man. He made a beautiful call about Adam Cole climbing to the top because nobody realizes why Adam Cole is climbing to the top. They're thinking that he's a coward. He's trying to escape the carnage down below. You know, if he goes over the top rope, if his feet hit the floor, you know, he loses the match for his team and he forfeits the match for the Undisputed Era, right? Those are the rules. So Ricochet is up top and you got Cole... And Ricochet up top. Ricochet meets him up top. They start brawling. Strong comes up. And they look to push Ricochet off the top of the cage. So it was called out by Nigel McGuinness that Adam Cole baited Ricochet to go up there. Because you know him and Adam Cole have a history. Roderick Strong was there. And it was it became a double team to a point where Ricochet was about to be thrown over the top. To force him to hit the ground on the outside so that his team loses. This was a last-ditch effort by the Undisputed Era to bait Ricochet up top and force him over the top rope. I love this o- over the cage. This was fantastic and a beautiful call by Nigel McGuinness, man. You don't see that attention to detail on commentaries most times when you're watching the main roster. I thought that was brilliant. So, that backfired. Ricochet starts fighting. Now, Dunn then gets involved. Dunn looks to try and suplex Cole to the mat. O'Reilly comes up and assists Cole... Rowe climbs up to assist Dunn. Fish comes over to help Cole and O'Reilly. This leads to a major avalanche seven-man superplex powerbomb combo from the top of the cage to the mat. Ricochet was watching the carnage as if, as if he's a fucking Spider-Man in real life, just watching from the, the Empire State Building all the carnage down below. And this is where... Ricochet does the unthinkable. I don't know what the fuck this was. People were calling it a double rotation moonsault off the top of the cage. It looked like a reverse 630 that he usually does. He does a 630, but he did it just standing backwards. That's what it looked like to me. Double rotation moonsault, reverse 630, whatever the fuck it was, man. He jumped off the top of the cage and like a fucking bowling ball off the top of the cage landed on all seven men down below. Unbelievable. And when people tell me Ricochet ain't going to get over, Ricochet is just another vanilla midget that Vince McMahon's going to look at, is too small, or he's, the, he's a certain color, what, whatever. If you're Vince McMahon, I hope you had eyes on this fucking show tonight. That is your future right there. If you don't think so, you need better eyesight, man. You need better eyesight. Huge double rotation, moonstall, 630 reverse off the top rope, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Came crashing down on everybody. Both teams recover and look on from their own ring. You got the baby faces in one ring. You got the heels in the other. It's fucking war. War games coming to life here. And they just start going crazy on each other, man. Big brawl. Eight men just brawling all over the place. Fish and Roe go at it. Roe with a big knee to the face. Hanson goes up top, hits a big leg drop on Fish. That was the War Raiders finishing move. O'Reilly grabs Roe. Strong launches in with a kick. Hanson takes out Strong and O'Reilly with a handspring double back elbow. Hanson easily had to be 25 minutes in this match and... He's still doing fucking double handstand reverse back elbows. I mean, if you don't respect that fucking body of work that man did tonight, I don't know. I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, he's the he is my Hanson is my MVP for War Games tonight. 
No matter how good Ricochet is, no matter how good Pete Dunne is, no matter how long Adam Cole was in that ring, Hanson is my MVP tonight. Double handspring back elbow. Ricochet ends up springboarding at Cole, taking him out. Dunne then unloads on Cole. Cole counters and spikes Dunne with DDT. More offense from Adam Cole to Pete Dunne. Cole then exposes his own knee. He was going for the last shot. Pete Dunne ducks it. Dunne drops Cole on his head, and Ricochet flies in with a 450, in for the follow-up on top of Cole. Dunne and Ricochet cover Adam Cole arm-in-arm for the pin. So they both pinned Adam Cole at the same time, and the babyfaces win. Pete Dunne, Ricochet, and the War Raiders win an unbelievable War Games match to close NXT TakeOver War Games. At the end of the match, Dunne and Ricochet got their titles shoulder to shoulder, and they clutch their titles, standing above Adam Cole. They climb up to the top of the cage, and the show goes off the air with both Ricochet holding the North American Championship and Pete Dunne holding the UK Championship. And there's your match for Royal Rumble weekend. You can see where this shit is going, man. Royal Rumble. Takeover Phoenix is already booked. Champa Black. Cole. Ricochet. Done. Triple threat match for, I, I don't know, it may be for all titles. I don't fucking know. At this point, all titles on the line. And then you got the War Raiders versus Undisputed Era. Man, oh man, what a fucking show. I can't even begin to tell you this show tonight. Unreal. If you guys didn't watch it, I highly recommend you go and watch it. And give me your own ass- uh, assumption of what happened tonight, man. Th- that's all I got. That's all I got. I'm all, I'm smiling ear to ear, man, with this fucking show tonight. This is pro wrestling the way we need it. That's all I'm going to say. Takeover outdid itself tonight, man. The mentality with Triple H is a mentality that I wish everybody would take, not only in the WWE, but in life in general. What you did, what you did yesterday, right? You got to come and attack the next day and be better than you were yesterday. Every single takeover that this man puts together, is better than the last one. And if you don't have that mentality going forward, then I, I, I don't know what to say, man. It's the only thing that I it's the only thing that I know. I gotta be better every single day compared to yesterday. These shows continue to get better, man, and I see no end in sight. With the talent that this fucking company has in NXT, there's absolutely no way that we're ever gonna sit here and be disappointed w- with what they give us. Tonight was a clear indication of where WWE needs... Uh, again, it's the same fucking shit every month. It, it, it's a clear indication of where they need to go. Future-wise, for this company. By the time October 2019 hits, if this show isn't representing anything close to this, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. This is the way of the business. This is the future of the business. You either adapt, you either evolve... Or you fucking end up like Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. I'm getting out of here. Thank you guys so much, man. I'm JD. Hope you guys enjoyed the review. If you did, hit that thumbs up. I'll see you guys tomorrow for Survivor Series, man. The weekend is not over by a long shot. We got another six hours of Survivor Series tomorrow night on the WWE Network. And I'll be here to cover it all for you guys with the official review on tomorrow's pay-per-view. I'm JD. Hit that thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for the Survivor Series.